This time on the Highland Woodworker. We'll take you out to the Louisville Slugger Museum and Factory and show you how their world famous baseball bats and history are made there every day. Then meet a young woodworker who quit his job waiting tables and is now building quite a name for himself in the restaurant furniture industry. Popular Woodworking's Chuck Bender shows us a quick and easy way to make your next project shine with shellac. You know, in a lot of philosophies around the world, wood is still a living thing long after it becomes a piece of furniture. It has a spirit, it has a soul. And I love that idea. We'll spend an inspiring moment with woodworking master and TV star, Scott Phillips. All of this and more, this time on The Highland Woodworker. Hello, I'm Charles Brock and I'm a Highland Woodworker. I just love coming to Highland Woodworking in Atlanta, Georgia. It's where a woodworker feels at home. Hello, Ed Sint. Hey, Chuck, good to see you. Nice to see you. You know, I understand Benchcrafted has a new vice and it's a classic. It is a classic. It uh, has this beautiful finish and it's the same high quality of all the devices. Sounds great. I can't wait to see it. But you know, there's another classic that we're going to have on the show. Louisville Slugger Bats. Oh great, I hope you get the tour of their plant. I heard it's an amazing tour. We're gonna take a tour right now and we're gonna learn how they're turned. Well, I'm with Rick Redman. Rick, so nice to see you. Charles, it's great to have you guys here at Louisville Slugger. Welcome. This is where woodworking and baseball come together. It really is, and it's the great American success story. Our company is now in its 130th year in baseball, and certainly we've been in woodworking even longer than that. Our company started with a, a group of German immigrants who were woodworkers back in Europe, and they ended up in Louisville in the mid-1800s, and they were making things like butter churns and balusters and porch railings and you know all the wooden products of the day. And they had a young son named Bud Hilrick, who used to sneak off to watch the Louisville Eclipse baseball team play <laughs> games. And one particular fateful afternoon in 1884, he went to the game, and the star player of the team was a guy named Pete Browning. And that day, Browning struggled at the plate. He didn't get a hit, and he actually broke his bat. And after the game, it was a different era, young Bud Hilrick was able to go up to Pete Browning and say, hey, my father owns a woodworking shop. If you want to come back and join me there, I'll be happy to make you a new bat. And the legend is they did exactly that. They went back to the woodworking shop, picked out a nice piece of northern white ash, put it on the lathe, started turning it off, feel it, pump it, swing it, back on, off, on, so they got it exactly the way Pete Browning wanted that bat. He took the bat to the ballpark the next day, got three hits, his team won the game, and thus the Louisville Slugger was born. That's great. I can't wait to see the rest of it. Let's go. Let's go to the factory. All right, I'm following you. All right, Charles, on the way to the factory, I thought I would show you a couple of really cool things here at our Louisville Slugger Museum. Uh, just amazing pieces of history and none better than this one right here. This is a Babe Ruth bat from 1927, the year that the Babe hit his 60 home runs. This is from that famous Yankees Murderer's Row team, you know, said to be the greatest offensive lineup in baseball history. Well, for woodworkers, this is an expensive piece of lumber. <laughs> you better believe it. If you look around the oval logo right there, you'll see 21 notches carved around it. And what Babe Ruth did is he carved a notch like an Old West gunslinger for every home run that he hit with this bat. There are 21 notches on this bat. So he hit 21 or over a third of his record 60 home runs in 1927 with this bat. And it has been valued by all the people in the memorabilia and collectibles industry at a million and a half dollars. So you're right, this is a very expensive piece of lumber. All right, Charles, this is another great piece of history here at Louisville Slugger Museum. It is 
one of three bats that Joe DiMaggio used in his 56 game hit streak in 1941. And as a matter of fact, this is the third bat. So this is the bat that DiMaggio used to set that record. And many people, of course, say that 56 game hit streak is the one record in baseball that will never be broken. So an amazing piece of history right there. Tell you what, it's all over the place around here. You see one thing and then you look over there and you see something else and you want to see it too. <laughs> well, let's keep going. All right, let's uh, go to the factory and show you how we make all these bats that ended up making all this history. The woodworkers would love it. Let's go. Well, Rick, this smells just <laughs> like something I'm used to, and I'm surrounded by these wood billets. Yeah. Tell it, me about it. You know, uh, every time I walk in our factory, it reminds me of when I had woodworking shop back when I was a kid, <laughs> and uh, I love that smell. It just yeah. is a great, great smell, and it takes me back to my childhood in so many different ways, which uh, is so much fun. But. This is our staging area. This is where we stage all of the wood before we turn that wood into baseball bats for major league players, minor league players, and things that we're going to sell at retail, like at a sporting goods store. Well, where does it come from? We harvest our timber in the forests of New York and Pennsylvania. There's about a 50-mile wide swath of land along that New York-Pennsylvania border that is just perfect for growing timber for baseball bats, and that's because they have very long winters, there's a very short growing season, and that means that those growth rings and those trees are very, very tight, and that means we're getting really, really hard wood. We not only harvest the wood from that area, we harvest it from the north-facing slopes of that area because wow. it's even colder and the growing season is even shorter, and that's where we found throughout decades of experience that that is the best place to harvest timber for baseball bats. All right, what you're seeing here is our tracer legs in action. And this is the way we made baseball bats up until about the year 2000 or so. And actually, we're still making them that way, but the ones you're seeing being made here will not be used by professional players. These are bats that will be sold at retail. So uh, this is something that you would find in a sporting goods store or perhaps uh, a big box uh, kind of a discount store. From the very beginning, uh, in the 1800s all the way up really until uh, the early 1980s, we were hand turning bats, and that's the only way we did it. All right, I want to introduce you to somebody really special here at Louisville Slugger, a guy who's been around a long time. This is Danny Luckett. He's been here for 45 years making Major wow. League player baseball bats. As a matter of fact, when Hank Aaron visited us a few years ago, Hank said, I should have taken Danny into the Hall of Fame with me because the last uh, seven, eight, nine years of Hank's career, Danny made his bats. So uh, Danny made those bats that Hank Aaron used to set all of his records and uh, set the home run record. Well, you're in the Wood Turners Hall. Of fame. Danny, so nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Right, what a, first thing I was doing was using this tool here. It's called a roughing chisel to rough it down to get pretty much the shape I wanted. Then I used this tool to make the knob, make sure the knobs are right. You know. Sure. So we have to measure each one of them and use that. Then I used this chisel. It's a knob chisel. We call it a knob tool to make the knob. Uh -huh. That way you, you know, it's got a point to it where you can really get close to it. Sure. And I use this lighter chisel. It's about half the weight of this big one to finish it off and get it smooth enough where I can sand the wrinkles out of it. Then I cut it, measured it with a stick, cut it off, measured it. Took the parting chisel. This is, in, this is homemade, by the way. We use the calipers to check the sides back and forth. It's about every inch or so when you're doing it. Great experience. Thank you so much, Danny. You're welcome. All right, so now you're seeing uh, our CNC computer numeric control machine uh, in action. This is the machine that makes all of our Major League Baseball player bats. Uh, the billet, which is uh, the dowel, uh, 37 inches in length and uh, just under 3 inches in diameter, is placed onto uh, the CNC, and of course all the specifications for that particular player's bat are in the computer, and 
and uh, it begins to carve the bat. Uh, the old-fashioned way of hand-turning a bat, which we did for over 100 years, would take 15 to 20 minutes to hand-turn one bat. The tracer lathes would uh, take uh, you know a couple of minutes or so. Our CNC can carve a bat, as you can see here, in about 45 seconds. And the specifications are exacting. Uh, it is just really uh, spectacular and amazing. Uh, the the quality and the exacting specifications that we get using the CNC. And that's it. And that's it. Uh, of course, now it's going to go down the production line and be sanded, be branded, have finish put on it. And of course, you know, making a major league player's bat is far more scientific than most people ever expect because when a player orders a bat, at 34 inches and 32 ounces, or 33 and a half inches and 31 and a half ounces, they don't want it 32.1 ounces or 31.9 ounces. They want it 32. Well, let's go see the rest. All right. The bats are loaded on the uh, conveyor belt, and then they go down into the machine where uh, the nubs are sawed off, the bat is sanded, uh, and it actually, if it's going to be cupped, uh, the cup on the end of the bat uh, takes place. And basically what that does is it's like a huge drill bit that goes in to the very end of the bat and carves a cup into it and takes about a half an ounce of weight out of the bat. And the purpose of that is to reduce the weight without reducing the mass of the bat and help the player increase their swing speed. So a little bit lighter, get that bat through the hitting zone a little bit quicker, helps guys catch up to that fastball. Well, Rick, uh, I really appreciate you having me here at the plant because I know almost nobody gets to see this. <laughs> well, that's not really the case. We get uh, about 300,000 visitors a year coming through. Tours like this one right here. Uh, we're thrilled to have people come through our factory every day and get to see this great baseball history and uh, how our company is really inextricably linked with the great game of baseball, America's Pastime. Well, I'm glad I wasn't that special. <laughs> and I'm glad you shared it. Well, you are very special. And we did take you behind the yellow lines and behind the scenes to see a few things that uh, everybody doesn't see. But most people can come in here and see this stuff all the time, see our museum. It's a great tour. And if you're a baseball fan or even just a woodworking fan, you need to come see the Louisville Slugger Museum and Factory. I think it's a wonderful thing. And last time I went behind the yellow lines of the place, I was arrested and there were warrants involved. Thank you so much. Well, we Rick. promise we won't arrest you. Come back and see us again. Ed, can you show me that vise that we were talking about? Yes, yeah, bench scratcher glide vise. This is the classic one. Uh, it looks great, and you know you can you can almost feel and you can definitely see. That bench crafted quality. Yeah, the quality of the machining is just unparalleled. This actually is so efficient when you give it a light spin, it just spins for inches. Well, I've seen that, and I'd love to have that efficiency in my shop. And I tell you, I'm going to install mine in a, a bench that's my favorite old work bench. And I think I want that crisscross. The crisscross, yeah, for the front vice, what they call a chop. The, yeah. And uh, a lot of people build their own bench and want this hardware, but you can also outfit an existing bench as well. Well, you've got what I need and I'm going to take it. I hope it turns out great for you. Thank you, Ed. Coming up. You got to work pretty quickly because shellac dries very rapidly. Find out why Chuck Bender banks on badgers when applying shellac to his projects. Then hear about Scott Phillips, big woodworking project as a young boy and his hilarious monumental mishap. There was about $5,000 worth of wood in the thing. You don't want to miss this, so stay where you are. You're watching The Highland Woodworker. Saw Stop is the only table saw that stops on contact with skin. Its safety features and unmatched quality and craftsmanship have made it the best-selling cabinet saw in America. Put a saw stop in your shop. Are your tools Tormac sharp? Tormac, consistent, reliable, and razor sharp. Tormac, sharpening innovation. Introducing the ultimate blush trim rounder bit by Whiteside. Get CNC quality cuts from your patterns every time. Whiteside, industrial grade and American made. Craig, from the first cut to the final assembly. 
providing woodworkers with products that help simplify woodworking challenges. Craig. Manufacturer of the award-winning Woodworker 2 presents the PVW blade, designed specifically for the rip and cross-cutting of plywood and plywood veneers without splintering or chip outs. Highland Woodworking has been a leader in woodworking education for over 30 years. They offer all kinds of woodworking classes year-round, ranging from how to hand cut dovetails and mortises to how to sharpen a plane or a chisel, how to build a cabinet, a chair, or a bookcase, or how to turn a wooden bowl. There are classes on wood finishing, French polishing, and even antique furniture restoration. For a list of upcoming classes that may interest you, go to highlandwoodworking.com. When you need a great, fast finish, shellac just might be your answer. Chuck Bender shows us how he does it, this time on Popular Woodworking's Tips, Tricks, and Techniques. There are always a lot of questions, I'm sure, about, uh, about finishing, and shellac and brushes, it just doesn't work for me. Can, can you help me? Sure. We get a lot of those kind of things at the magazine, too. Lots of readers have, lot, have problems with brushing shellac brush marks, overlaps, things like that. So what it really boils down to is getting just the right viscosity on the shellac. And what I've got here is some one pound cut, which is one pound of shellac flakes dissolved in a gallon of alcohol. Now, obviously, I don't have a gallon here, so, but you pour that off, mix it up, and it's pretty thin. And the other thing I like to do is keep a very dry brush. I mean, if I go on there now, you can see I'm building up a, a tiny little bit of a shine on there, but it's, it's not puddling. Okay? Sure. Yeah. So all I'll do is I'll dip my, the, just the bristles of the brush, just the tips, um, right into the shellac, about an eighth of an inch down. And what I like to do is start with my edges of my, these are drawer fronts for a, a piece that's coming up in the magazine. And you got to work pretty quickly because shellac dries very rapidly. So um, there are no runs, as I can see. I mean, it's not just, yet. Yeah. Give me time. I'll get there. <laughs> so I'll hit my edges, and that way you can see here where I'm sliding across the face and getting a little bit of lap mm -hmm. on, on that top edge. I'll sure. take all of that out when I go back and put the shellac on the face. So I'll hit this handle real quick inside. And do we still have the same concept of, of uh, maybe one coat of shellac melting into the other coat? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the great thing about shellac is um, if you get a few lap marks on this, you can sand them out. Or what I like to do if you get a, a sag or a run or something like that is to take a rag soaked up in alcohol and just sort of buff it out a little bit. It'll stretch out if you yeah. don't wait too long. Yeah. Okay. Now you can see what I'm doing here is I'm actually working, I start by working in a couple of inches from the end and go out to the end because if I go this way, all I'm going to do, maybe it'll be better down here. If I go this way, it'll start to sure. puddle up there and come up and over that edge. Yeah, so, that always happens to me. Right. That's so if I tip. come in from the end a little bit, a couple of inches and go out, and then just using the tips of the brush, 
roll back and forth across there. I mean, you can see it comes out pretty smooth. Now this is really thin and it's going to dry up and this is almost going to go back to that. Well, this is one that I did earlier. And you can see it's somewhere in between a really wet look and a completely dry look. This has just some aniline dye on it. Sure. Subsequent coats will build pretty quickly and once I get that first coat on at a one pound cut then I'll actually move to like a one and a half or two pound cut so that it builds a little quicker on top. This actually, if you feel that, you can actually um, feel that it's sort of raised the grain a little bit. So yeah. I'll, I'll take and run over this a little lightly with some 400 grit sandpaper and then up and my and density. It's drying so quick. Oh sure, yeah. this is almost, it's just a little tacky right now, but if we wait another minute or two, it'll be to the touch. That's dry. Right. Well, that's great. I think I'm going to get me a, you say a badger brush? Badger hair brush. That's what I use. I right. found those just to be the best. A one pound cut? To start with, and then you can up to one and a half or two pounds. Mm -hmm. If you buy your shellac already made in a can, they, the amber stuff comes through at about a three pound cut, so you'll need to add some alcohol to it to thin it down. Yeah. I think so. I'm ready to go. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Matt Alexander is a young woodworker and maker of excellent simple furniture for commercial clients. Let me introduce you to him this time on Generation Next. Yeah, I made a conscious decision at one point, uh, I guess in college. I was working at a restaurant and I just hated it. And I quit that job and swore to myself I'd never work another job that didn't have something to do with building things or furniture or art. I'm Matt Alexander. I'm from uh, Las Casas, Tennessee. Uh, I run Holler Design, a furniture design build studio. I love working with wood. All the way back to me being a kid, I, I was working with wood in my dad's shop, I can remember playing around with pieces of cedar and things like that. And I love the fact that wood comes from uh, the property that's been in our family for so long. And you know, that kind of grew when I went into being a sculptor and actually learning how to uh, process wood uh, properly from <laughs> a rough sawn state to uh, uh, you know, a finished form and I played around with carving wood. So I guess that was my true introduction to uh, wood for furniture making. I went uh, from Knoxville at UT to uh, Detroit with Cranbrook Academy of Art to New York. I uh, worked as a studio assistant for a designer for uh, a couple years. I worked for an um, um, architecture firm doing some freelance stuff from, for them for a uh, couple years. I was teaching art as well <laughs> in addition to doing all that uh, while I was living there. And in 2009 I moved back to uh, Tennessee. Maybe the first year I came, came back to Tennessee I made maybe maybe just under 20 pieces of furniture, and then it went to about 70 pieces of furniture the next year. That third year, it jumped to about 170-something pieces of furniture, so I think this year I'm on track to break 200, and it's, <laughs> it's too much. <laughs> the marketing for Holler Design has been uh, relied heavily on friends. <laughs> I've, uh, I actually find that the best methods are just doing a good job for somebody and then having them uh, pass it on word of mouth. Uh, that's the most in invaluable uh, piece of marketing that I've ever come across. What is the old saying, like, uh, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life or something like that? <laughs> it's a, that's, uh, uh, I guess, kind of what I've been going off of here uh, the last couple of years. When I was 33 years old, I was hit by lightning. That explains a lot. Master woodworker Scott Phillips and the moment that completely changed everything. Coming up next. Rikon Power Tools, a leader in woodworking power tools for over 10 years with a passion for quality and performance at an affordable price. Rikon has a full line of dependable tools, including a long list of industry-leading bandsaws, 
like their new powerful 10 350 14 inch professional. Rikon Power Tools, tools designed by woodworkers. Do you need wood? Then go nowhere but Val Forest Products. Come stand in awe of our 20,000 square foot showroom that houses over 75 species of exotic wood, the largest in the Midwest. What more could you want? A knowledgeable staff? Well, come in and speak to one of these handsome young men because they know wood. They breathe wood. They eat wood. They live wood. They love wood. They are wood. So plan your adventure to Bell Forest Products, 200 East Hematite Street, downtown Ishpeming, or visit us online at bellforestproducts.com. Because we got wood. Masterpiece Wood Finish is a special three-part oil and wax system designed to enhance the beauty of wood. It's easy to apply, maintain, and repair. Applying several coats of the base coat, mid coat, and top coat to a prepared wood surface will create a finish that will make a craftsman smile. I helped develop Masterpiece Wood Finish, not just for your masterpiece, but mine too. Saw Stop is the only table saw that stops on contact with skin. Its safety features and unmatched quality and craftsmanship have made it the best selling cabinet saw in America. Put a Saw Stop in your shop. If you can't make it to Atlanta, then you can always shop us on the web at www.highlandwoodworking.com. Moment with a Master is presented by Masterpiece Wood Finishes, helping you build beautiful furniture. For decades, Scott Phillips has inspired and entertained woodworkers on his public television show, The American Wood Shop. As you're about to see, his energy for work and life are totally authentic. Hello, I'm Scott Phillips. Welcome to the American Wood Shop. Scott Phillips has made a living building furniture and relationships in front of a national audience. His popular PBS series, The American Wood Shop, has been a staple since the early 90s. The American Wood Shop has always tried to be a practical guide to woodworking. And what we try to do is we learn new things, incorporate those new things into the show. And also, the joy of joys, Chuck, just like you, is interviewing people from all walks all over the world. Woodworking has deep roots in the Phillips family, and Scott was able to soak it all in at an early age. I was always encouraged by my father and my grandfathers to work with my hands and be self-reliant and uh, just have a passion for wood too because dad's that forester that in 1947 got that first masters from Purdue in forestry. Very inspiring. My father promised me when I was 12 that he'd build me a tree fort. And this is really when my woodworking career took off. Um, and there was a stack of beautiful walnut boards, 12 inches wide, not a knot in them. And dad didn't move fast enough and he was gone on a timber buying trip and we built the world's most expensive tree fort out of walnut. All the neighborhood kids got involved and it was a masterpiece. Uh, when he got home, he said, you know, you shouldn't have done that. He didn't punish me, but he made me take down that walnut tree fort because there was about $5,000 worth of wood in the thing. And I understand that. And we recycled that wood. Maybe that's how I ended up being a recycler of wood and a forester as well, and a woodworker. Those treehouse building and stewardship skills will come in handy for Scott's next monumental masterpiece. I am building bigger and bigger pieces now, bigger and bigger, and I'm embarking on a house project as well, which will be a piece of furniture on the inside in the finished work. And that's what my barn is loaded with, all the wood, that's air drying now will become part of that greenhouse, not so big, it will be off the grid. I'm experimenting with all sorts of technologies so that my utility bill will be zero. Now naturally I'll have to have a well, but the beauty of this place is going to be the wood inside and out that speaks legions about how this house is part of the earth. I love the scrub plane. 
Oh, I do too. It's a phenomenal tool that so many people don't know of and skew it slightly. And what's nice about it, this board has a slight cup to it and you can take down the surface of a cup board and make it flat in a heartbeat and you can smooth out your board. This is going to be a piece of a rustic trestle table that I'm making. And once you have the crown out of it, what you can do is go to your four and a half smoother and granted I'm doing this a little bit faster than normal because we're rolling tape and you know time's precious so we'll just take that right now, on down. Now you can see the board. And yes. And if you have any considerations to be made you can kind work of with it. it. Yeah. Exactly and then I can take the smoothing plane now and just smooth that rascal out. And I get accused of being in love with power tools, but the truth is, it's the hand tools that really make that connection with the wood and really help you to understand it. Understand what the grain's doing and how can you have more fun. Scott always makes woodworking look fun, but it's a job he takes very seriously. In a lot of philosophies around the world, wood is still a living thing long after it becomes a piece of furniture. It has a spirit, it has a soul, and I love that idea. Well, that might sound a little intimidating for the folks who are just learning the craft, but take note of his great advice. We all make mistakes. We all have good days and bad days, and the, the good news is if you're in the wood shop, it's okay. You're going to make mistakes. Don't let that define who you are. Let that inspire you to come up with great solutions that could be an innovation that changes the face of woodworking. And whatever you do, put your own signature on your work. When you're done with a piece, I don't care however humble it is, this is not an act of vanity. Get a good Sharpie marker, a permanent marker, and sign that piece and put a date on there so that people will know down the road, this is not for you, this is for people 100 years, 200, 300 years from now, so they know the person that made that. That's very important. And if you don't think so, just watch Antiques Roadshow. Every woodworker can't wait to have their signature piece. For Scott, it was a stool. 14 years old, this is the project that I made for $100 and I had to learn how to turn and I did that on a Shopsmith Mark V because it was a decent wood lathe and then taking slabs of walnut from the lumber yard that were green you learned how to season dry green wood so that you didn't have a fortune in it and you'd also learn how to do a chainsaw so it started simply and the thing is it has to be solid so you learn your joint work early on and with turning and mortise and tenon joints it has to be right or it's not going to be solid. So I became a stool maker first and foremost, and I love to turn. And I've got a problem. I have seven wood lathes. Need one, but, you know, when you buy a good one and you have many good times on it, you just can't get rid of it, you know? So anyways, turning's really the best joy in woodworking that I have. A big turning point for Scott came years later on a stormy afternoon while tying his boat to a dock. When I was 33 years old, I was hit by lightning. That explains a lot, okay? But the truth is, I did have one of those experiences where I went through the tunnel of light and I was there with Christ at Heaven's Gate. And the very first thing I asked Christ was, what's the meaning of life? And he flooded the answer into me, and that is to make it better. And I replied, that's it. And he said, what else is there? Scott survived the lightning strike and continues to live by those words to this day. And it wasn't long after his near-death experience that the love of his life, Susie, walked into the picture. She is now not only his wife, but his co-host on The Big Show. I want you to see what Susie does. Okay, she starts with something like that. And it's three pieces of wood that she scroll saws out and then does a little bit of hand carving and then she ends up with something like this and it's she just can do absolutely anything that she wants to do 
And so she's an inspiration to me. She shows a lot of people unique ways to approach woodworking and she keeps it simple, sometimes a lot more simple than I do. Okay, but she adds so much to the woodworking show because she just digs in and does it. And that's what everybody should do with woodworking. If you see something you want to do, do it. Scott certainly does it. From his show to his commissions, he is always working, learning, and encouraging other woodworkers. My ultimate legacy would be pay it forward, okay? Once you learn some skills, share it with others. Um, because we have to share these wonderful ideas for future generations. Woodworking is part of American society and uh, it always will be because we're surrounded by a rich timber resource here that we need to learn to take good care of, be good stewards of. And in a beautiful piece of furniture, when you look at it, it should embody the spirit of the tree growing in the wild to it being created into a beautiful piece of furniture. Now that's the serious side of me. Now, the other side of me would say, I would want to be remembered for making the world's finest boomerangs because these are the ultimate in woodworking. They fly and they do come back, but they are very complicated. Scientific American wrote an essay, 20 pages long and at the very end last sentence, and we still don't understand how they work. These work and so should you get busy in the wood shop and go make something out of wood and have some fun. God bless. Wow. Couldn't wait to get this classic traditional leg vise installed on my bench. It's just perfect, like most things from Bench Crafted. Uh, I carve a lot of spindles doing handwork. And let me show you, it holds the thing just beautifully without a lot of chatter, which is what you want. I mean, I can move it around, concentrate on the work, don't have to worry about how the work is being held. So, this is just a great tool. You can put it on your bench if you get the retro model, or you can get the solo model and build a brand new brand new bench either way now it's got this beautiful handle hub and wonderfully double threaded machine screw that's an inch and a quarter on the inside that gives it that real quick half inch per revolution travel that you're just gonna love and if you'd like you can get a crisscross at the bottom which holds the chop, which is this piece here that I carved, uh, it holds it in alignment so there's no racking when you're using it. If you put something in there, it'll close evenly. Well, this is the answer for my bench. It just made woodworking a whole lot easier, especially with hand tools. That's bench crafted for you. <laughs> Improve your woodworking experience. Sign up for Wood News Online, a monthly newsletter showcasing the latest news, tips, and classes Highland Woodworking has to offer. By signing up, you'll receive the latest episode of the Highland Woodworker, special store promotions, and Wood News Online delivered straight to your inbox. Sign up today. That's all the time we have left for this episode. Don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Until next time, I'm Charles Brock and I'm a Highland Woodworker.